Good morning. I welcome you all as we are gathering on this third Sunday of Epiphany. I want to welcome anyone who may be worshiping with us for the first time, either here in the sanctuary or joining us online. I want to thank Sean Dooley, who is our tech person this morning. And also a big thank you to our Minister of Discipleship, Gail McLaughlin, who preached last Sunday and provided pastoral care while I was away on vacation, and it's always good to be back. The altar flowers this morning are in memory of Kay Holden, and they are given in loving memory by her sister Marjorie or render and our apologies to Marjorie. This was supposed to be done in December, but with our church administrator out with her broken slash dislocated ankle, that didn't happen. So we are doing it this morning. I'm looking forward to this morning's sermon. It is a Ask the Pastor version with our children doing the questions, and I always love their questions. They ask such wonderful questions that sometimes we adults aren't comfortable asking ourselves. And I know that Gail has a couple of announcements. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Because we're doing Ask the Pastor Junior, there is no Sunday school today. The children are invited to stay for the whole service and hear their questions answered. Um, We actually had so many questions that I doubt we'll get to all of them today. So we're going to invite you, if you would like to, whether your question doesn't get asked or if you have more questions or didn't get a chance to submit a question, if you would like to, you can submit a video of yourself asking that question and then Reverend, I'll take a video of Reverend Hughes hearing it for the first time, and he has to answer it, just as if we were doing it during the service. If you do not want to submit a video, that's fine too. We can have other children ask, or I can ask him the questions, but they'll be on video, and he hasn't heard any of them before, and he won't hear any of them until he has to answer them. So more details to come. If you um, submitted questions that weren't asked, if you have more questions, feel free to send them to me and we'll make sure they get asked and answered. Thank you. And any of the really difficult questions, I will let Gail answer. (laughs) I'd like to call upon Grace weberg Fischetti, who also has an announcement on behalf of our youth. Good morning. Good morning. So, Thank you to everyone who donated or contributed to Operation Clothesline. Thanks to your donations, we were able to collect 17 hats, 15 pairs of gloves, and 137 pairs of wool socks. That will be taken into Boston next Saturday for us to distribute to the homeless population there. If there are any uh, youths in grades 6 through 12 who would like to join Operation Clothesline, We will be meeting here at the church next Saturday at 9 a.m. to drive into Boston. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. And we've actually had another few donations this morning. And if you have any donations, you can drop them off in the church uh, office this week when it is open. As Grace said, we'll be heading in on Saturday at 9 a.m. Also... Our thanks to our newly elected council members who have agreed to serve. They are Warren Pierce, Ed Tisdale, Owen McDonald, Heidi Hastings, and Dick Giswaldo, who will be filling in for a two-year unexpired term. They will be installed on February 13th during the service of worship. Are there any other announcements? If not, then let us draw near to God's throne of grace as we celebrate his son who is the light of the world.
join me in the call to worship. We come this day seeking the light of God's truth. We come seeking God's peace that passes all understanding. We come seeking the love that will make our hearts sing. And the joy that will make our hearts glad. Together, let us follow the one who is in our hearts with all of these blessings. Together, let us join me in the prayer of invocation. God of this day and all the days that are yet to be, you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end of all things, as young as a newborn child and as ageless as the stars above us. So we ask you this day to lay your hand upon our hearts that we may in all ways be your faithful sons and daughters. This we ask in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world and who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, 
and the glory forever. Amen. be seated. We are told that Jesus is the light of the world. In Matthew's gospel, he also says that you, I, we are the light of the world, called to bring his love into the community and the world around us. This is just one example of how we do that. Before we receive the offering this morning, I'd like to take a moment and to dedicate these socks and hats and gloves. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we give you thanks for the generosity of all in this community of faith. And we give you thanks for our youth. We ask your blessing upon them as they prepare to go this week to the Boston of Common and to love one another and the lows that were least among us, even as you love us. Amen. join me in the prayer of dedication. We come to your altar, Lord, with an offering of gratitude for your love that came to dwell among us, full of grace and truth. May the gifts that we dedicate now with humble hearts allow the light of Christ to shine more brightly for all to see. This we ask as we continue to follow the one in whom you were well pleased. Amen. So a special good morning to our children and young at heart. I wonder if your parents ever ask you to do things at home. Like maybe if you play an instrument or a sport, this is Savannah's sheet music for her saxophone, and I think I have to ask her about 85 times a day if she's practiced yet. Maybe they ask you to put away your toys or Maybe you have to take out the trash. Is that anybody's favorite job? Definitely not in our house. Maybe they ask you to put away the dishes or just not leave them around the house. Maybe they ask you to turn off the TV or your tablet. Do any of these things happen in your house? Do your parents ask you to do things? Now, do you always do those things the first time you're asked? I wonder if, do you ever hear your parents use your full name, like all three names? 
or ask if you were listening to them or to repeat what they said to you? Do you ever hear, Richard Allen Hughes, are you listening to me? What did I say to you? I don't remember. <laughs> Does that ever happen in your house? If you ask my children, they would tell you it happens in our house. But did you know it even happens to adults too? Sometimes we don't listen. And sometimes we do listen, but we don't act on what we heard. Does that ever happen? Like you heard your parents say, take out the trash, but you didn't do it right away. And in today's Bible story, Jesus is telling the people all about the good news and the good things that are going to happen, but he tells them these good things are going to happen when you hear it, when you listen. And part of listening is doing. And so Jesus asks us to do with him. He can't do it all alone, so he asks us to follow him. And when we follow Jesus and we listen to the stories and do the good things that we are asked to do, we can share God's love and forgiveness with others. We can help others. We can see it today with the youth group and all of these donations of socks and with everybody that donated all of these warm items of clothing. We can see that their hearts are so full of love and they're listening to those stories that Jesus is sharing with us. And they are sharing God's love with others. And so I wonder if any time you hear a Bible story, whether it's in church or at home or wherever you are, I wonder if once you hear it, can you think of ways that you can go do those good things that you're asked to do? I'm going to try harder to do that, and I challenge you to join me. Let us pray. Oh, Holy One, thank you for the stories that you have given us. Thank you for Jesus and all of the things that he teaches us. We ask for your presence and your guidance as we try to read and understand each of these stories, and as we try to do our best to share the love that you have given us with everyone we meet. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Please join me in the responsive call to prayer. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. Good people, let us enter into this time of sacred silence. Sisters and brothers, are there prayers that you would like to lift up to the Lord this day? Yes. So, 
So the people of Tonga are still struggling to get their lives and their country back on its feet, and we give thanks for the many countries and organizations that are helping them do that. We ask that God be with them. Lord, in your goodness. Barbara? My friend Barbara, and it, it is already metastasized. So we lift up Barbara in our prayers for, unfortunately, her diagnosis of cancer and the fact that it's metastasized. We ask that God give her strength and peace as she walks the path that is before her. Lord, in your goodness. We lift up in prayer all those who have been diagnosed with COVID both in our congregation, community, and in the wider world. And we also pray that this wave that thankfully, at least here in this part of the country is on the decline is the last of this pandemic. Lord, in your goodness. I lift up in prayer also uh, Gail McLaughlin's friend Liz who is in the ICU due to COVID. Lord, in your goodness. Received word last night that Mary Lou Harrison, a member of our community of faith, had a bad fall. She was in the hospital, but is home now and recovering. We ask God's healing to be upon her. Lord, in your goodness. We've also been asked to pray by Meredith Turner for Cooper Carosa, or Carosa, who's three years old. His uh, family in our prayers as well. Uh, Cooper has been diagnosed with childhood cancer and is traveling to St. Jude's Hospital in Tennessee. We ask uh, that God's healing be upon Cooper and with his family as well. Lord, in your goodness. Charlene Malik has asked us uh, to pray for her friend Mary Ellen, whose cancer has returned again. We ask God's healing to be upon her. Lord, in your goodness. Joe and Leslie Musiak's a friend, Larry, we keep in our prayers as he says goodbye to his father, Al. We ask that God to be with him as he says the sacred goodbye. Lord, in your goodness. We also lift up Joe's niece, Lori Rosier, who is in the final stages of her battle with Huntington's disease. She is now on hospice care. We ask God's peace to be with her as she walks this final path. Lord, in your goodness. We lift up as well all those in our congregation who are in need of prayers on the prayer list that appears in the Hilltop News. We uh, ask that God be with them. Lord, in your goodness. And then uh, finally, I believe many of you have heard about the tragic accident over in Wilmington where a woman unfortunately was driving her car and it got hit by an MBTA commuter uh, train. I learned last night that the woman, Roberta Sosville, uh, was the driver of the car. Roberta actually sings in the Ipswich River Community Chorale, which rehearses here every week. Dawn, Sally, Putney, and I know her, and so our hearts go out to her family. Lord, in your goodness. Nancy Ferretti is requesting prayers for the family of Mary Ristino, who lost her battle with cancer this week. Mary was a former resident of North Reading, wife, mom, friend, and nurse. So we lift up Mary and her family and ask for God's strength as they say their sacred goodbyes. Lord, in your goodness. Let us pray. Good and most gracious God, you have heard the prayers of your faithful sons and daughters who have gathered here this day and are with us in spirit online. 
You have heard uh, the prayers that we have uttered and those that are still unspoken in our hearts. And we give you thanks that your spirit is always with us, walking beside us, sometimes behind us to keep us going when life is challenging, sometimes ahead of us, waiting for us in the future with a blessing. Good and gracious, oh God, help us to continually nurture the embers of faith in our hearts that we might be more aware of your spirit of wisdom, your spirit that is our comforter and our guide. Help us uh, to claim our calling to be the light of the world, both on our own, in our day-to-day -day lives, and also together as a community of faith, that we may touch this community in the wider world with that peace that passes all understanding, with that truth that can truly set us free, with the joy that the world cannot give or take away, and the love from you that truly makes life worth living. All this we pray as humble disciples of our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 14 to 21. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went out through all the surrounding country. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Here ends the reading of the word. Let us pray. God of all that is holy and human, we give you thanks for the sacred scripture. And as we enter into this time of reflection, we ask that your spirit open our hearts that we may receive your wisdom. And I ask your blessing that I might be prepared for the unexpected. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, you ready? I'm as ready as I'll ever be. All right. Our first question comes from Caroline, who wants to know, if God can make anything, why haven't we seen any magical unicorns in real life? Ah. 
Well, this isn't in the Bible, Caroline, but legend has it that the unicorns, there aren't any unicorns today because when Noah built the ark and brought in two of every animal when there was the flood, that the unicorns didn't get there in time. And so that's why supposedly there are no unicorns today. And you know what? I like to think of this story because it reminds me that when God says something, I need to listen. And who knows, God's always creating. And maybe somewhere down the road, God might create a unicorn. But the important thing I think to remember is that when God says something, we need to listen. Noah listened and built the ark and saved all of those animals. And so when God says something, it's for our good. And so we do need to listen. Thank you for that question. We have two Abbeys, but one Abbey wants to know, why do we stand when we sing songs in church? Why do we stand when we sing songs in church? And the simple answer to that is that there's an expression. You stand up for something you believe in. And sometimes that doesn't mean literally stand up, but it means that when we really believe in something, we're going to stand up for it. So when we stand, when we sing in worship, we're basically saying, I believe this. And I believe all the truth in the songs that we sing. And I believe that the love that it's talking about that God has for us is very real and very true. Dylan would like to know, what was Jesus' favorite color? <laughs> what was Jesus' favorite color? You know, unfortunately, the Gospels don't answer every question that we might have about Jesus. And uh, since, well, I do know him personally, but I've never sat down and had a face-to-face -face conversation and been able to say, hey, Jesus, what's your favorite color? So I'm going to take a guess. And I would say that because Jesus loves everyone equally, all colors are his favorite. Ryan wants to know, who wrote the Bible? So uh, Ryan and everyone here, you've got about an hour and a half. <laughs> it's not an easy question to answer because the Bible was written by many different people. And particularly the first five books of the Old Testament that we call the five books of Moses. That was an oral tradition. So, you know, sometimes somebody will tell you a story, but they're not reading it in a book. Well, that's the way it was for that part of the Bible. People knew all of these stories like Noah that I mentioned just a little while ago, and they told the story over and over for many, many generations. And they got, so they knew it by heart. You know, if your mother tells you a story and she skips a page because she wants to go to bed or wants you to go to bed and you say, wait a minute, there's a part of the story that's missing. Well, people knew the story so well that they knew it word for word. So some of it, like the very first books of the Bible, were oral and then somebody eventually wrote them down. We don't know who. They had scribes back in olden days and they would write things down. And then there were prophets and prophets would go out and they would uh, talk to people and say what God wanted them to do, and the scribes would write down their words. Gospels that tell us about the life of Jesus, those were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Some of them were followers, like Matthew. And then we have, well, they were actual disciples of Jesus. The vast majority of the New Testament was written by a man by the name of Apostle Paul. And Paul went around all the countries 
in the Eastern Mediterranean and talked about Jesus and actually started churches. And we can say thank you to the Apostle Paul because of him, the good news about Jesus spread everywhere and eventually here. And so we're here because of him. So the short answer is the Bible was written by many different people over a period of about a thousand years. Lucy wants to know, why doesn't God have a mommy and daddy and why wasn't God ever a baby? Wow, Lucy, that is a good question. Why doesn't God have a mommy and a daddy and uh, why wasn't God ever young? A baby. A baby, okay. And the answer is that's one of the mysteries about God. See, we can't understand everything about God. If we could understand everything about God, then we would be God, and that's not good. I don't want to be responsible for the whole world. God has always been. So God was never born, and because he was never born, God didn't have a mother and a father. God will never die. God is forever. And so that's why God didn't grow up and why God doesn't have a mom or a dad. There's a saying in the book of Revelation where God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end of all things. And so even before our world existed, God was, and then God created everything. I don't understand how God could be forever, but that is why God didn't have a mother or father and didn't grow up from being a baby. So related to that answer, Riley would like to know, she says, people always say that God was always here, but how was he always living if he created the universe and everything in it, and where did he get his power to create the universe? Great questions. Again, it's a mystery. We can't understand everything about God. I'm going to give you a big word that's very simple. God created everything ex nihilo, which means out of nothing. It's Latin for out of nothing. Because you think about it, if God used something that already exists, then it means that it was as old as God. And so God created everything out of nothing. And again, there's so much about God that we'll never know. In fact, one of the things that I say to myself is that when my time comes to leave this world and I go to heaven, as I hope I will, because I do believe in Jesus, that God will answer all of my questions. In fact, remember a few minutes ago I talked about the Apostle Paul and he wrote all of these letters. And in one of his letters, and interestingly enough, it will be in the scripture next Sunday. The Apostle Paul says, now I only know in part, but then I shall see God face to face, and then I shall fully understand, even as I have been fully understood. And what Paul is saying there is that, you know, we're only human and we can't know everything. And that is so true. I took calculus when I was in high school. I never really understood it. I still don't understand it. I can open the hood of my car and I can look at an engine. I don't understand how it works, but I know that it works. And I know that calculus is true. And the same thing is true with God. There's so much that we will never understand, but we can trust this, which is what we do know. And that is that God's love for us never fails. So you talked a moment ago about when you, well, you hope that you'll go to heaven. Yes. So Bridget wants to know, when you die, are you an angel in heaven? So what the Bible says is that when we die, it's almost like going to sleep. And then when Jesus comes back, we don't know when that will be, but once again, the Bible says that he will come back. We're all going to be raised. 
And we are going to be like the angels, the Bible says, but we're not going to actually be angels. God says, or in uh, one of the Psalms, Psalm 8 actually, it says that God has made us a little less than the angels. So we have our. Although I would like to have a halo. Well, that'd be fun. Yeah. We have some up in the attic for the pageant if you want to borrow one. There we go. And, and um, I don't think you want me playing a harp. Luckily, our harps don't actually make music. Right. So. Um, so, our other Abby, Abigail wants to know why does Reverend Hughes wear special clothes and when does he put them on? Does he do it at home or at church? Ah, there I go. Thank you, Abigail. So, different churches have different traditions. In our church, ministers wear robes. There are some churches where they don't wear robes. And they might wear a suit and tie. I even know of some churches where the minister gets up there in dungarees. And it drives me crazy, untucked shirts. It's a part of their tradition. There's nothing that says you have to do it this way or you have to do it that way. In some churches, ministers, usually priests, they wear a white collar that shows everyone that they're a priest. And they actually wear those even in their day-to-day -day life. And we wear robes to help us remember that we have been called by God to share the good news about God and Jesus with everyone. And actually, I'm going to ask our minister of discipleship to come over here for a second. And all the children and the children at heart, do you notice anything different about how she's dressed and how I'm dressed? What's that? Sleeves, yep. Yeah. So she has more of an open sleeve, yeah. And, and, and my sleeves have these. These are called doctoral bars because I've received my doctorate. Anything else that you notice that's different about how she's dressed and I dress? Oh, no stole. See this thing here? This is called a stole. And in many traditions, ministers will wear a stole like this. But Gail can't wear this yet because, well, you tell her. Why can't you wear this? Because I am not ordained. I have not finished learning all the things that I need to know to be a pastor. That's right. And so when I was ordained, after I took my vows and said that I would serve God, they put this stole. It's called the yoke of ministry, taking on the yoke of ministry. And it's a way of symbolizing that I have accepted God's call for me to be a minister. Interesting story about this. This stole is 40 years old. When I was ordained in the church I grew up in, in Whitman, Massachusetts, our former minister came back and he gave me this stole. And he put it on me and it has great meaning to me. And my minister growing up had the best name for a minister. You know what my minister's name was? Reverend Sin. <laughs> Two ends. <laughs> oh, and, and I put my robe on in my office. I keep this in the office. So, I don't know if all of our young people know. What are dungarees? Oh, dungarees are the... the, the I, I don't know, I don't wear them. <laughs> Jeans. Jeans, okay. Jeans, sorry. I, I don't know. Boy, I just dated myself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I go back to when you had bell-bottom jeans. Ask your parents what bell-bottoms are. Those made a comeback. Yes, they have. All right, so we have a few from Arden and Dorothy. I'm not sure who actually asked All right. these, but one of them. Which came first, caveman, Jesus, or God? Actually, that's a fairly easy question to ask, answer. Um, God obviously came first because God is everlasting. There's no beginning when God wasn't, and there will be no time when God isn't. So God came first, and cavemen, 
or for those who want to take the story of creation literally, uh, Adam and Eve, and then Jesus. Since they submitted their questions together, we have another one from them. Um, what does God look like? Good question. So, in 1 John, we're told that God is spirit. And so, we can't see God. And, you know, it's interesting. I knew that question was coming. I don't know why, but I just knew it was coming. Uh, there's only one person in the entire Bible who ever saw God. Anybody know who it is? Gold star to anyone who can tell me. The only person in the Bible who knew Jesus. Very good. Gold star to Dave Poplaski. Moses. When Moses went up on Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments, God let him see him. But he couldn't see God's face because God said, if you see my face, it'll be too much and, and you'll die. So Moses was allowed to see the back of, of God. And we're told that when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, his face was shining because he had seen God. And it was so bright they had to put a veil over him. But we can't see God directly, but we can see God indirectly. So you look out the window and look at the clouds and the changing of the seasons and a beautiful sunset. Those are ways of looking and seeing God, not face to face, but knowing that God's there. So uh, for example, in my house, I have a big braided rug, okay? My mother made that braided rug. I also have a quilt. My mother made that quilt. And my mother passed away probably about 15, 18 years ago. And so I can't see her anymore. But I can look at that quilt and I can remember her and know that she is with God. And the same thing, the world around us is a way of looking and seeing and knowing that God is there. I think we have time for one more question. Right. And remember, if you have more questions, it's not too late. All right, so of course it's my kid who, it's not a short one. Ayla wants to know, how does Reverend Hughes know so much about God? And if he learned it all at school, how did those teachers and the teachers before them know so much about God? Because only God knows everything. That's true. Only God knows everything. And uh, Ayla, I can tell you that I know so much of God for a couple reasons. One is, like all of our children and everyone else here, I went to church. And I learned about God, and I read my Bible, and that helped me learn about God. And then, after I graduated from college, I went to seminary. Three years of seminary, full time, and took all kinds of classes. I took classes on Old Testament and New Testament and theology, which is thinking and studying about God, and worship and pastoral care. And then I went back for my doctorate, and that was another two years. But here's something else that's important. I haven't stopped learning. I still am learning. And every week we have a Bible study, and some of my Bible study members are here this morning, and they will tell you that I love Bible study because they'll ask a question that I never thought about before, and I'll have to think it through so that I can understand it. Or they'll see something in the Bible that I don't see. And so I'm still learning. And as I said earlier, I'll continue to learn even after I die, because when I go to heaven, I have all kinds of questions I want to ask God. And I know that God will Embrace me and answer my questions. Thank you all, children. Did we get through all of them? We did not get through all of them. Our children had wonderful questions. And as Gail said, 
if you want to video yourself asking the questions, send them to her, and I will give a response. We're going to show them, I think, during the service, and uh, each week we'll do one, and we'll post them on our Facebook page as well. I thank you all. Let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks for our children, for their inquisitive minds, the questions that they ask. And we remember how Jesus said that unless you become as a child, you will not enter the kingdom. And so we pray that we may have their trust and their questions and their humbleness and their ability to love without exception. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. People of God, our service of worship has ended. Let us prepare to go forth wherever we may be to continue our service of love, knowing that our God goes before us. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Creator Christ and Holy Spirit, be upon you all. Amen. Amen.